Okay. I call this meeting of the Ohio County Fiscal Court to order, and, and this is uh, uh, September the 26th, 2017, at 5 p.m. And I want to, to ask uh, Artie Shepard to come forward and lead us in a prayer and a pledge. through the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, Father God, for this great country that we live in. And thank you for this great county and our good leaders. We ask that you bless us today, Lord. Let us make good choices, right decisions, that will better serve our county. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, now I want to ask Marty Fisher to come forward. He has a presentation today. Ohio County Airport Board, along with the Ohio County Fiscal Court, would like to thank Bill Wallace for over 20 years of dedicated service to Ohio County. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you all very much. And uh, of course, that was the airport board. And don't forget uh, the uh, second Saturday in uh, October, we're all invited to the airport to have an open house day out there. Now, I want to introduce to you Amelia Wilson. She was she's from Congressman Jamie Comer's office, and she's just going to introduce herself. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm Congressman Comer's field representative for October, I mean, uh, for uh, his office in Ohio County. If there's ever anything we can do, feel free to, to give me a call. Thank you all. And Amelia, you're going to have an a office open here one day in October. October 17th from uh, uh, 1 to 2. Okay, October 17th, she's going to be here. If anybody has any questions for the Congressman, that's time to get them out. Uh, before you have the uh, minutes, as uh, Miranda told you, there's a slight correction on the bids for the uh, uh, park building, and so from the August 22nd meeting. So uh, we want you to uh, mo a motion to approve the minutes as amended. So, motion by Larry Cam. Second. Second by Joe. Joe Barnes. Any discussion, questions, or additions? Being none, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Before you have the bills, payments, and transfers, uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve? Make a motion. Who moved? I will. Jason Bullock? Second. Second to Sam Small.
All in favor say aye. Opposed like sign. Okay, the uh, bills and claims and payments and transfers are approved as presented. Do y'all have a copy of the resolution 2018-6? She's going to get them for you quickly. The way, the way I understand it is uh, the uh, our associations, the Magistrate Association and the Judge Association and KCO and all those wants us to prove this, urging them to uh, preserve the uh, retirement plan that uh, everybody's been expecting. It was promised to. On this resolution, does it go into any kind of detail? Not really. I know they're asking for a sizable contribution from the county as well. Uh, and I know this is just in support of the resolution, but if this support along with others makes it happen, what kind of increase, percentage increase are we looking at, Ann, on our, our county contribution? Well, the letter we received from the state, what they're projecting would be $270,000. A year? And that's, that would be about a 10% increase or 8% or? 19 to 28, so. Two hundred and how much? Now, whether or not they'll land on that number. I understand. Now, if we, we pass this resolution, does that mean that we're supporting it? It has to put a tax on or let's cut read pieces? Let's read it. Read it. I don't want to support nothing like that. Do they have to have this back at a certain time or anything? No, just letter support. Okay. This is basically the support. Why don't we get you all a copy of this? And, and uh, copy and pay for the next I'll make a motion to pay for the next meeting. I'll second. Okay, the resolution 2018-6 pension reform is tabled, and all of you can make a point to get a copy and read it over. Uh, of course, you know, whatever we do, we're just in, 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 encouraging them to do it. We have no authority to do this. My understanding that the, uh, the, the county workers and uh, law enforcement and different things, uh, that it's that particular part of the retirement's in good shape. I think it's the teachers that, uh, uh, were, were they going to make any difference in it? Or did they allude to that? Any, as far as separating the two, there was talk at one time of separating the two. Well, they talked about it. One of the problems they said is if you separate the two, you have, you have administrative cost over two of them, right. where it's cheaper to do one. So what Makes they'll sense. end up, yeah, what they'll end up doing, I don't know. Okay. okay. I've got an extra copy here. We we uh, we paid some minutes uh, for the last meeting. We I mean for that minute that was uh that was uh, amended, but we didn't do the most immediate last meeting, which was what day? September 12th, September 12th May. So I need a motion to approve the September the 12th minutes as well. So moved. Motion by Sam Small. Second. Second by Larry Cam. Uh, any questions about that one? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed like sign. Minutes are approved. Uh, Charlie. Yes, sir. He has two things. Both concern the same thing. Well, uh, three things. He has three things. Why he's standing up? Make a quick stop. I will, sir. <laughs> the first one is uh, I need a resolution to approve our five-year solid waste plan. I've got all the other cities on board. Got all their resolutions back. And what this does, I have a copy of the plan. <laughs> Anybody wants to see it? 176 pages that we got done. And what this does, it keeps us in going for the next five years, getting state money to keep our solid waste program up and going. I'll make a motion. Second. Any further discussion? Yes, that's all that. Any further discussion? Bingman, go ahead and roll call this one, Miranda. Corpio? Yes. Small? Yes. Bullock? Yes. Barnes? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Camp? Yes. 
next one is uh, the map I'm passing out for an update on the 911 addressing rule we're at today. <coughs> and I've been up in the 4th district and uh, Did you say, what about that solid waste re, uh, resolution? Next time? No, that's what we just did. So. That was that resolution. For, to, to authorize the five-year plan. Same thing. Yeah. On the other right. resolution, Charlie, I just passed them out. Nobody was aware of the ones that Justin done the final uh, cap on. So uh, we're going to wait a couple weeks and let every manager take a look at it, read it, whatever. And that's fine, because what we did on that one is the uh, one that Sam and Joe went the changes on the last time we met. We made the changes, and uh, I thought I emailed you know, Justin, but uh, yeah, we—I don't know when we got. Yeah, yeah. but you know, it's, it's all the changes, so they want to look. That's totally fine with them. Nine one one addressing updates. To date, we have done twenty three roads. Six out of twenty three had to be changed, and what we're doing is the yellow things that you got in your hand. We're walking to every house and putting them on there because about every house up there does not either a have numbers on their house or on a mailbox. So that's what's taking us so long to do the 911 address. Are you also going to be addressing like if it's 210 and you go on the next is 195 or like you know? Correct. We're addressing all that. Oh, so and that was... We're doing a district at a time, getting it all down. So when we do a road, we're coming back and get with the electric companies, the water companies everybody in that area make sure everybody's on the same page before we send out the certified letters and like i said it's going to take a while because with two of us doing it doing a mile road the other day i even clocked it. it took us about three and a half hours and that was only about i think it was like 16 houses on that one mile or down that way and that was reach road so we were just walking that and we had to hang them on every one but, and that's how I'll keep y'all updated on the maps. The next one will actually, the maps will be color coded. The ones we have to change, the ones we did not have to change. So I'll make sure I'll pass that out the next time. Okay. Approximately how many are you going to have to change? Do you know? Well, I mean, Larry's district, I figured I'd start up, the, up in that area and we'll get all the bugs worked out of it. And six out of 23 so far. So to me, that ain't too bad. And what we're doing is, I called all the other counties who went through this. If it's within two tenths, and what I mean by that is, if you start on a road and you go down two tenths on your odometer, you should be 200. If you're on the right, it should be even. If you're on the left, it should be odd numbers. So if you go down there and the house is 400, we're changing it. If it's 300, it's within the two tenths, so we're, we ain't changing it. And that's why with the GPS is and all that's working out for us. And also, when we get these done, I have to get with 911 and make sure everything meets. So if somebody calls 911, it meets up. But let me tell you, when we get into the cities, it's going to be, it's going to be some changes. Okay. Any questions for, uh, any further questions for Charlie on that? I'm ready. I'll get that resolution for you tomorrow. Okay, uh, we discussed in uh, committee meeting, I'll let you, uh, except Sam and I briefed him after we come out of it, uh, on the uh, House Bill 303, we're not going to have human, say that big word for me, unanimity, I, I think I got it right. Uh, if, if I didn't, well, I'll straighten it out for you, print it, please. Uh, but anyway, I moved. So that we can send this to uh, the legislator and the senator and get it back to DLG within a timely manner that we approve the list that I presented on the House Bill 303 project list and to authorize the judge to sign all documentation. I make that's in the form of a motion from me. I second. Okay, just go call. I got a question for And the Horse Branch Fire Station is moved to the top. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
to the top of the new card, right. which is number six. So and they'll be the first one to receive the money. Yes, that's next on the list. And there's no restrictions on it. They can use it for equipment, correct? Correct. Yes. Small? Yes. Bullock? Yes. Barnes? No. Johnson? Yes. Yeah. No. Motion carries, and uh, we've had a good discussion. We don't have to always agree. Just as long as it's uh, warfare don't break out, and uh, I respect the opinions of the descending uh, parties. Uh, we got bids in for Sharif Bridge, which uh, these we've been doing on the house on the state contract. This time we're going to have to open the bids. It's in Larry's district, so I'm going to hand them to him. And Joe, would you come down here and help him open them? Well, we got two bids. Yes. Construction and excavating out of Slaughter's, Kentucky, and the total it's uh, divided up somewhat into uh, demolishing the existing bridge, foundation work, and dirt work, and assembling a new uh, boom and box covert, and it comes to two hundred fifteen thousand five hundred ninety-nine dollars. That's what I saw. How big a bridge? <laughs> well, we got a hundred thousand dollars to do it. So, well, if you want to finish it, I can just go ahead and win. And that's not construction. What was that? Cruising bridge. No, we have to push free. They might say I'm just guessing all the free variants. Well, they. Yeah, I know that they picked up the specs and them. Uh, well, no, they've got it individually. So, just to assemble, assemble. And installed a new aluminum box cover is $175,500. Well, that's what we need. Uh, the rest of it is, is what we can do. Yeah. 175 what? Uh, 500. Okay, now that's the number we got to work with. Okay, now the other. Here's this uh, contact engineering solution. Uh -huh. Contact. And they, they've got a box clover. $95,365. No, they, they do put it together, though. I mean, we've been, that's what we've been dealing with. It. Yeah, they, they have it delivered, uh, and we do all the, everything else that they've sent. We do all the digging and hunting and covering and all that. Accept them. So moved. Ninety-five. Who's the ninety-five for them? Contact the one we've been dealing with. Do I have a second? Second. Second to Sam's mom. Second. 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 Yes. Good yes. question, David. Is that the same size as what we've been doing? Because it seems like it keeps going up. No, it's bigger. It's bigger. It's oh, it's this largest one we've done. Okay. The largest one. And yeah, them ditches up towards the hill are deep. Wow. <laughs> you did say ditches. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. The. Um, Conservation District met last week, had a two hour public hearing, waiting for anyone that wanted to show up to uh, uh, protest the tax rate. No one showed up. We all sat there for uh, 
two hours, and then we're going to accept the presentation. And it's a uh, real property 3.009, personal property 4.066, and motor vehicle and watercraft 1.8. And we just have to acknowledge that they gave it to us. How was that? Uh, how was that rated for us for the last two years? It's up just a little bit because assessments was down. The, the rate of the same Very well. Each prop, it'll be, be on each prop, it'll be on each prop, it'll be on, correct? Yes, but like pins. Yeah, it was it the pins. compensating rate? No, that's 4% plus compensation. Yeah. So and it's still it was for example, on top of that. 4% above, uh, above uh, what it was. So it was 4% above the compensating rate? Yes. So, so. Moved to no. it was how much above the compensating rate? So 4%. 4%? Yeah. But theirs is so little, they're next to the bottom of the list, so it's, so you'll never notice it. Who said it? All, all in favor of the, acknowledge that we got it. May I? Uh, all right. Opposed? Can't hardly deny we got it right here. It is. Um, this is just going to be a little bit talking. I talked to a couple of you about it, but not all of you. Um, as you know, we have a new park director, and uh, the park board has become inactive for the last few years, and all the terms have expired. Uh, I need a name from each one of you. I talked to some of you about it. About, uh, uh, I need a name for uh, Park Board or your uh, district. And uh, if at all possible, get it to me by the next meeting. And uh, I had someone come in today would like to, that used to be in your district would like to have back. But, and uh, I, Jason and I have talked about the church. I talked about the church. So, so all of you try to have me named by the next meeting. And I can't tell you who your was last except for Larry's. And that was, uh, and, and uh, same. Mine was Billy Young. Yeah, here's Billy Young. If I thought of that right now. He's actually about the only one I've appointed since I've been judge. How often do they meet? Once a month. Once every month. Uh, and uh, that needs to be pretty out of it on, a, on a certain day. And that's a very good thing for to have when you're working at the park. Well, most of the time, it's good to have. Okay, good deal. I'll put him down there. So we won't do this appointment the next time. Okay. Do you have a list of separate Okay. Uh, Keith and I and uh, Charlie and several of us met last week. There's a program the state's doing called Safety Circuit Riding. And they look for unsafe conditions on roads and they'll give us some money for signage, but this is going to be a joint thing between the state and county to find dangerous places to try to figure out what to do with them. Uh, we will have input on where they go and uh, we pointed a uh, almost on the committee. Uh, well, I just figured out who one of them's going to be. Uh, the circuit riders will consist of uh, Keith Nelson, Charlie Shields, uh, Tom Woods, uh, would one of the ma new magistrates agree to serve on me? I'd like to. Okay. Larry Cam, representing fiscal court. Keep you when the meetings are we, we will. Um, and uh, Buddy Shrewsbury. Oh man, can I take mine back? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask Alan or, or Tracy who has to get, but since they sent you with me, I figured it named one of you. Okay, that's just a point of the thought that we don't have to vote on there or nothing. Um, how many, how many magistrates do you have on that? Right. Would you have two? You want to do it too? Write him down too. Joe Barnes added to the list. Okay. You got that last name, didn't you, Joe? That last, that last name was on there in the day. 
Yeah, that, that, that changed me. He brought me right in there. Is he running for something this year? Hey, uh, I want to point the viewing committee to look at J.T. King Road, possibility of extending it, 0.15 mile. Uh, and this is pending. The, I want to go ahead and get the viewing committee appointed, but the easements will have to be signed, the petition signed to get that done. So the people that live there, that own property there. Keith yeah. Bender, the distance we had, right? Uh, I want to point Keith Nelson because he necessarily has, needs to be for sure. Uh, well, you get two independent viewers. He, he already served on this road, too. Yes. Yeah. And then I'm going to see if Marty Tishner will do it for me. Thank you. Helen, he he is she still here? No. Uh, Helen Lamb. Uh, I'm sure she will. Helen, Helen the Okay. Uh, that's the viewing committee. Sound good, Justin? Sounds good. If, you, if Miranda will just go ahead and forward me their petition, whatever, whatever, whatever petition we're just Okay, now we're ready for committee reports. Has any other committees met? Uh, you appointed the last time on H uh, on the Advent Code, did you, Larry, or, or not? Uh, I believe it did. Yes, and uh, Renetta, has she got the bed? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I had one question about it. It was overall, overall departments. I thought that's the way we left it the other day after the meeting. Not just the road department, but covered all departments. I just wanted to make sure, is that the way she wrote it up? Let me, um, she hasn't broken it since. Oh, she hasn't done it yet. She's done okay. it. Okay, okay, she's not done with it. That's fine. Okay. We'll catch it in two weeks. Okay, any other committees? Matt wants to make a report? Well, Jim, committee. Yeah, yes, I think I will wait for yeah, that uh, report. You know what? Let's make this next, and then I'll get to you, Brett. Let's do this real quickly, as quick as quick, we can. Magic, let's call you guys first. Sam. No, uh, Jason. I just want to get to you about those, that water hydrant, that fire hydrant we are talking about. We'll get it. Well, yeah, we'll I'll get, get you on that and talk to Walt about price on that. Okay. It's 32000 but ask him what it's I'll get with him on the Okay. Uh, Joe. No. no. Thank you, Joe. No. 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 Yeah, I've got a couple of things. Uh, we had a fire up at uh, Rosine on South Island Five yesterday. It brought to my attention that there is a car hiding up there that is dry. It's there by the uh, Windy Hill. Oh, Charlie, did you check that out? Well, I know they're doing some work up there on the Windy Hill tire. I just don't know what the status, but I'll find out about that. Well, the tire's been dry for a while, hasn't it? Uh, I could yeah, it be a year or something. Does that mean the fire hydrant was too? No, they, they don't use it no more. Yeah. They it's don't good. use it because they said they couldn't keep water purified. But what about the fire hydrant? No, I, I, I was told, I don't well, know. Because the water line still goes down the road, right? right. But I know there's a water hydrant right on down, right in front of 2713 that they was using, right across the road. I forgot what that road was, that we put one there. I know that's where they're filling up. They tried to win the deal, they could not do it. So I, I was able to ask Walt and I saw him, but we might ought to get a committee or something together to check all the hydrants because yes. if we wait too late, that'd be too late to go to one minute. It's dry. not working. Check that out, find out why that's dry. And I do understand that there was to be an inspection of all of them within the next month anyway. You remember me asking the firefighters people that? Yeah. I'll ask Walt tomorrow and find out. Okay. And it's brought to my attention coming through 231 that garbage trucks coming out of other counties are coming not tarped. Do we have an <coughs> ordinance on that where they're supposed to be tarped the garbage trucks? No, sir. And that's what we've been talking about, us, all of us up there. We do not have a parking ordinance. You know, any kind of, there's no state parking ordinance anywhere. But other counties does have a parking ordinance. What is it against the law, state law for them to not have tarp? There's no law saying that they have to have it. I thought the landfill, they said before you come to the landfill. Landfill. The landfill has yeah. one. The city goes across the scale, you got to the car. You got car. Yeah. If you're coming in, you do not have to park. And a lot of them are tarping when they get to the landfill road. That is a problem. We might ought to work on that. 
one of our main reasons. You know, we had one lose a lot of uh, uh, trash on 231 uh, this past week. Well, we had one on Dawson Road one time, and I thought that's why they went with the tarp, but it never did, because it, it was just they're at, waiting, they're waiting until at they the scales. They're, they're, they're waiting until they turn on the middle of the road, and we'll the tarp on the You know, I went by a day, Casey's one of the guys had theirs up, and there was no tarp, and they raised up the hill, there was paint up, the tarp already fell out, so after it got done, you put it back on top. Would you be, would you go with separate, or would you want to tackle this in this thing you're already working on, Larry? Or do you want us to look at a separate deal for tarp? I think it would be separate for people that's making a living off of hauling garbage. I think it would be separate. Okay. You have to have a little bit of leeway there, guys, and uh, land the devil's advocate here. But where you're just going from house to house. But we need to, we need to get it brought up to where that if you're out on the highway and you're going somewhere, then yes, it needs to be tarp. If you're making stops at every 200 feet or something like that, there has to be a little bit of. Uh, well, that much he right? has a big truck with the sides on. He goes from house to house, but he doesn't have a car on. Yeah, at all. I don't think. I, don't well, I mean, he has to before he goes to land. He has to, but I don't. I think they kind of. I'm not going to say that for sure now, but I, I was. The pretty, might be open to my the top. Well, I was thinking the top was open, but maybe not. What I was saying was, if you're just going from house to house every two or three hundred feet, yeah. then he has to roll his tarp every time. You gotta have a little bit of gray area in there. I don't know how you draw it up, but maybe need to. So if that's, that's wording and sometimes things. Oh, we're driving down the road and stuff blowing out. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly right. I don't disagree with that. Well, well are you coming from another county? Could you just do it from, because that's probably the big, big trucks coming from other counties. Would, would you agree, Larry, to work with uh, Charlie and uh, Justin on getting that proposal? Okay. Yeah. You're, you're going to that task. Charlie and Larry Morrison. Look like bookends. <laughs> and I got one more thing. Okay. There's a brochure hanging where you go into your office. Look what you can do in the Ohio County. And it's got all the everything, but it don't say anything about the Peabody thing down there. I'd like to see this and done away with it. Who, who put that in? I have no idea. I said, Jody, do that. <laughs> I, I, I've seen that, but I don't know. That's kind of like the catch all. For there's a, there's all kinds of them in there. I mean, it's a whole. Johnny brought something about school today, and it looked like that too. I was like, I'm going to do it. Now, that's just for that thing. But it's right. She can probably update it. Though. We definitely need to make sure that we're mentioning all the hunting and fishing. Right. Because there's a lot of people coming well, from out of state and like from out of this county to, to do the hunting and fishing down there at Peabody. There's down in the. Joe's, especially Joe's district, there's a lot of hunting and fishing. And, and, I talk, everybody. Okay. and some of mine. Some of mine and I talked to the new park director about it also needs to be reiterated that we, we have camping facilities at the park because there's a lot of people who come down there to hunt and camp, you know, rugged camp out there when they might use our facilities. Yeah, let's try to get some more now. Yeah, we need to advertise. Uh, Randy, would you try to find out who did that? And uh, we'll get hooked of them and tell them that we need the fishing and hunting in there. And, and like I said, it's camping in park. That's all I have. Okay, Rip, you're up. All right. Is, is there anybody in the public? Can we ask them? Because like, this, my understanding, this might take a little while. I don't think there is, but does somebody in the public have something to say real quick? Oh, I'm sorry. Anybody in the, uh, the general public have anything for good of the body? Uh, I just might say I thought this might take a little while. Okay. We all have to do a feasibility study for the jail. Uh, Sean Miller and Eric Rex is here tonight to present to you guys what they feel like we should do about our jail. And without further ado, I'll let y'all go. I'll just say on behalf of DLZ, thank you all for uh, letting us come here tonight to do the presentation. Thank you for letting us take on this feasibility study. As you all know, Eric was here the last time and I presented to you all sort of uh, how we do our studies, the uh, procedure that we go through. Eric's been working hard on this study. He's got 30 years experience in uh, justice architecture and architecture and fails are just pretty well what he does. Uh, so he's put together a great study. I think you all are going to be very informed by it. I'll let him go ahead and take over. Does everybody have a copy of the of our findings? Okay. And there are additional copies up here if anyone else would like to have one. 
We're going to uh, go through this tonight. I understand there's something maybe wrong with the projector, so we'll use the handout. And there's page numbers on the majority of all the pages, so as we go through that. Uh, once again, I am Eric Bratz, I'm the principal architect of the DLC, and what I do is I do jails. Uh, my kids ask me all the time, Dad, what jail were you in today? Uh, but it's something I take very near and dear. 30 years ago, uh, in, in May of 1987, I worked on my first uh, correctional project. And uh, my father, who will be 83 years old on Saturday, he and I, we still debate almost a uh, weekly basis on how jail should be designed. So just first and foremost, uh, page three is just a little bit about DLC. We're a full service architectural engineering firm. We do a lot of things other than just architecture and specifically jail projects. But I think one of the things about that is that over my um, 30 years and um, is doing this, I've designed over 20,000 uh, beds for jails. And that's a lot of jails. Um, that's from a planning point of view as well as a design point of view. And one of the things that we're very proud of at DLC is over the last five years, we all like rankings. Um, and over the last five years, DLZ architecture has been rated the number one design firm throughout the Midwest. Um, and that really comes from not just the designs, but also from the planning studies, working with the counties, small counties, medium-sized counties, large counties, but really developing what the overall needs for in their assessment for the county is uh, for the next 20 plus years uh, with that. On page four is just an example of uh, some of the folks, what I really call our, our lead design disciplines for each one of the uh, different parts of the jail. These are all DLZ employees, and one of the things that's pretty unique about this is that with all the services that we have to design jails, um, these are the, really the leads for each one of those. And pretty neat thing that we have to sell with, to our clients is that we've all been working together for at least 12 years, all of us together. And um, quite honestly, it's pretty much what we do, is we do jails, so we all can talk very uh, closely and dearly about this. Um, going back a couple more pages, you have a picture of Rowan County um, over Moorhead. This is um, going to be a facility that's going to be opening here in February of 2018. It's a 302 bed jail. They went from a very small jail that was actually on the, the university campus there. Um, the university wanted to purchase the building because it was kind of like right in the middle of Moorhead State. So they decided through very much dire strait needs for their facility that they sold their building to um, Moorhead State University and they actually bought an old tobacco warehouse and uh, they demolished that and we built a new building uh, for them. Um, it's under construction now, like I said, it'll be open and operational in um, February of 2018. Just a couple other projects, uh, fairly close, but here in Kentucky is Monroe County and Adair County through the AOC, we did the new justice or judicial centers and that I was able to work on. And then the next few pages, starting with Franklin County, which is uh, a very special project, not just uh, for DLZ, but quite honestly, throughout the entire country. It's Franklin County, it's Columbus, Ohio. It is uh, being labeled from the National Institute of Corrections, as well as the National Sheriff's Association as the premier uh, facility in the United States, because what we're doing in this design is we are addressing head on the societal issues of today, you know, the, the mental health, the behavioral management, and the addiction issues of the facility. Um, this is almost a hospital type like facility that we're able to accomplish a lot of things through. We'll go through all the other projects, but they're just uh, various different examples of um, different gels, sizes, sizes, uh, cost, types, approaches, supervision of many different types of gels that we have designed throughout um, the DLC Corporation with that. One of the things I'd like to really start to look at is on page 15, you see the number in the bottom right hand corner, and that is what is a feasibility study or the steps in an overall project. As I as I presented before and as I met with the gel committee, is that the, the without question to me, is the most important process or the most important uh, phase of a project is the feasibility study. The feasibility study is where you start to introduce the, the overall concept of doing something to the, to the county. Whether it's the scope of work, whether it's the cost of a project, why does it need to be this, why, what's wrong with our current jail. We start to address a lot of those items in that. 
And at, at the completion of one of the last things you'll hear me say, and I take this very sincerely, is that your next step is to figure out, okay, we, we understand we need to do something. This may be the cost of the project because of the size of it. How are we going to finance it? And I think that the next step beyond this is a meeting with financial advisors to talk to them about whatever the dollar amount is for the project is how can we pay for that. And I often look at the, um, the, the planning phase as something that may take a while, may take months, may take years, but the reality of it is, is let's make sure that in the feasibility studies, that's where you define the scope of the work, you've identified what the budget of the project is, and also um, a, a schedule for what needs to be implemented. From that, you also then will start to look at um, how you can pay for that. Page 17, there's really two aspects to a feasibility study. There's the things that um, the folks here in Ohio County, what you believe that you may need in a jail or detention center is that you look at what your visions are, what your needs are across the board, and then DLZ as your architect or as your design team, what we start to look at is, is ways to convey those thoughts, those images that you may have in your mind back to you through a feasibility study. The feasibility study is something that's a living document. It will last with you throughout the project. Uh, whenever you go to the coffee shop, you go to the store, you do whatever else, uh, people in the community you can start to say, why do we need to build this? Or why is it costing this? Or why is it this size? And you can go back to the feasibility study because that's where it really starts to identify the different aspects of that. Page 18 is, is overall really the planning process that we go through. There's a thing that's called the National Institute of Corrections. Uh, it's based, it's a part of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but the National Institute of Corrections really has their, their, their finger on the pulse of most county facilities across the United States. Maybe not to the intimacy of how many inmates does Rip have in his facility today, but they have a pretty good understanding of working through uh, most of the, the state's commonwealth of understanding what the conditions are of the existing jails across the country. From that, they have a process of how you plan for a new institution. It's called Pony, uh, planning for a new institution. They also have things how to operate facilities. And as a jail architect, one of the things I like to do is to, is to refer to all their documents that they have as I start to develop an overall um, jail uh, feasibility study. So one of the things I always look at, you're gonna see a just a, a brief few pages on, is the county demographics. We're gonna talk about the types of inmates you have, your jail population, uh, what you have with that. We did have a meeting, in a committee meeting, where we met with some of the folks that make your overall system here, what all makes uh, makes it, how it makes it work uh, throughout this um, process. Ultimately, as we've, we've talked about, is that this study is really a year 2040 plan. So what it means by that is that Projecting out to year 2040, that year, which in, in jail life, that's not that far away. Um, what kind of needs might you need for a facility at that point in time? Then I present to you what the costs are, whether it's the, the actual cost to build the building as well as the other costs that go with it. One thing to keep in mind, and once you get into a design phase, is something we do on every one of our projects and each of the three design phases, is not just talk to you about how big is your jail? How much is it going to cost? All the spatial um, adjacencies, but we also like to look at the staffing cost. How much is it going to cost to operate a facility? Because if you if you really break down and you look at the cost of a facility, most any county can most can afford to build a jail. What the, the problems gets into is how much does it cost to operate the building from your maintenance to your upkeep of, of the facility and then obviously your cost of your facility. Keep in mind that if you take one of your jail officers, jailers for your facility, and say that their salary plus all of their benefits all in is $40,000 a year, okay? And if you look at a post in a jail facility and it takes five people over 24 hours a day, seven days a week to man that one post, if you project that $40,000 of that five people at that one post over 20 years, that's $4 million for that one post if, if you have one of those in the facility. If you have three of those in a facility, that can be the cost of your gym. So just keep in mind that those staffing costs is something once you get into an overall design that you really need to pay close attention to that as well.
page 19 and 20. I won't go through all this, but I think it's just a pretty interesting information. It's from the U.S. Census Bureau. It really talks about the, the difference in the population growth of Ohio County back to eight, from 1880 to um, the 2016 estimated uh, consensus. And you can start to see basically every 20 years up until 1960, then I break it down into every 10 years of how you compare um, with your county growth. You can see back in um, 1900 was the largest uh, population, at least on a 10 year basis, that Ohio County has seen. And then you can also see uh, uh, Kentucky as a whole uh, what the population growth is, is there as well. Um, based on the 2016 information at the bottom of page uh, 19, what I like to look at there is, is, is what is the overall average age of your, of your county? Is it a county that's above average? Is it below average? What's the population of the younger folks, of the older folks? Is what kind of growth expectations might you have um, in the years coming from that? And we build that into our overall projections and stuff. Page 20 is just some additional information um, that you can go through, but just kind of looking at, uh, you know, your high school graduates, if people go to college, uh, the amount of people that own their homes, travel times, incomes, families living in poverty, as well as veterans, um, and thanks for all the veterans that we have. But in, in looking at that is also, this is all starts to weigh in the factors of how you might be able to pay for a facility. It's just some information that you're, uh, uh, financial folks will want to look at at some point in time. Page 21. Um, jails today, and you'll see a slide here in a little bit that uh, talks about it a little bit differently, but the reason I mentioned uh, my father, uh, the 83 on Saturday, and myself, the last 30 years, we're, we're still debating on how jails should be built. Um, so often, my dad will say is, you know, that six-sided concrete box, put them in there, throw away the key, and everything's just fine. Uh, that may be the case for some folks, but in reality of today is that we have very different inmates that are going in jails today back to 1940 when you built your original jail that had 12 inmates in that or 12 beds in that. And today we're looking at facilities that have much, much more uh, issues with mental health, with addictions, and with behavioral management facilities. Up to 70% of inmates across the country um, that are incarcerated actually have some type of mental health issues. And putting them in, in those six-sided concrete boxes just doesn't work. It's one of the reasons why you see such an enormous growth of what our incarceration rates are in the United States, is that how we designed jails 20 and 30 years ago, or earlier than that, they just don't work the same way. So these are just some of the things that we start to look at in facilities um, where it's quite a bit different. You know, 20 years ago, you may have had just a couple, three or four females in your facility. Today, it would be 20, 25% of facilities are actually females with that. Page 22, I think, is, is, is an important thing. I take the fiscal court as well as anyone else that's here is, is that this is the thing I think that as much as anything from our study that it is, is critical is that built or is to generate the awareness to the county of why do we need to do something and what those potential costs are. And then once people understand why we need to do something, then you start to build the consensus on um, getting that support to do this. Jails are tough projects. Um, there's always the discussions that I'd rather build a school, I'd rather build a fire station, other types of things, but jails are also um, one of the requirements that we all have to have. Um, I won't go through much on the next two or three pages, but it's just really a, uh, a the involvement of how jails were designed over the years. Page 23, similar, it's not a picture of your facility, but something that is very similar to your facility. is what It was called a linear style design, where literally when you had to go to each housing block or each pod or housing unit, whatever you like to call those, um, and, uh, jail officer, correction officer, had to get up and literally go to each and every single one of those. And it's pretty staff intensive to be able to supervise very many people in doing something like that. So over the years, a couple of different options that have been um, incorporated, for example, page 24, this is a, an example of what is called a direct supervision. The jail over in Lexington, or the one up in Evansville, are very similar to a situation like this where we put a correctional officer actually in the housing unit. 
Um, he's unarmed, but he's in that housing unit, and he's he's able to communicate with the folks face to face um, every moment of every day, being able to um, being able to communicate and overall overall supervise what those folks are. It's uh, it's pretty costly to operate the facilities, but what we see in the long term is that the facilities they actually will last longer uh, because they're typically. Uh, better maintained by the inmates instead of trying to break things all the time and try to damage things is that they actually take care of the facilities a little bit better. Page 25 is really uh, designs of today, what we're doing in facilities. If you can imagine the single white dot in the middle is, a, is like a guard post of where a, a correctional officer would sit and then he can look into each one of these housing blocks. So one person can actually see all the movement uh, it depends on the size of your facility, but 120, 150 inmates, one person can control visually, not just through cameras and monitors, but visually straight on, line of sight, um, manage that amount of people and all the door movement or the door opening and closing and the movement of the inmates into different areas with that. Um, also, you'll see the gray area that goes around the, the yellowish color. That gray area is like a perimeter chase that goes around. And in that chase is where all the, the heating, the cool, all the duct work, the heating, the cooling, the exhaust, the plumbing, the electrical, all the technology for all the cameras and stuff. That's all in that gray area outside of the secure jail part of that. So what happens is that the Jamaican staff can go along and uh, they can do all their work without having to move inmates uh, from one of the housing units into a, a, a different space. It's pretty creative, and, but I think that what you would see is that it works very well in overall jail designs today. Page 27 is, is part of the interview process when we met and a couple times we walked through the facility. Just a lot of different um, items with that. Don't necessarily need to read all the items for you, but I think that one of the things is that to keep in mind is that your jail's at 52 beds. And it's been that way for you know 20 years or so. But one of the things about that is that currently in your jail, you're getting numbers that are in the 60s, 70s, even 80s. You're well over your capacity of your facility. And, and that's, that's a security issue, not just for the inmates, but also for the folks that are working in there. Rip and his staff, they do, a, quite honestly, they do a remarkable job of keeping things under control in that type of an environment. You know, walking through the facility, you can see that the, the folks that work there and Rip specifically, he deserve, he demands the respect of all the, the inmates that are there. But at the same time, it is over capacity and that, that is a problem um, in, in, with your jail. You know, you've, you've been able to maintain your facility for a long time. Um, something that you know Ohio County should be very proud of, but there's a point in time where it, your facility is just worn out. Um, you're still able to use the facility, you know, you get by and things, but your overall facility is wore out. Core services. Core services, what I mean by that is your intake area, your, your kitchen area, your administration area, your laundry area, uh, those type of things that are really the core services that make the overall facility work. Um, it's hard pressed to say that they're designed for 52 beds, let alone you get up into eights and um, you make it work, um, which is very admirable for that, but just for the way things are designed today to be efficient and to work the best, they're just under, undersized with that. Also your type of inmates, like I said earlier, the type of inmates that you have in your facility today are very different than what you had before. Uh, medical cost, um, mental health issue cost, those things are just becoming more and more prevalent in your overall facility, not just here in Ohio County, not just in Kentucky, but throughout the entire country. Um, you know, the, if, if you go back and start to think about the war on drugs in the 1980s and 1990s, what well, has resulted in a lot of people in jail, but also we, we still have a very serious uh, drug problem and it's, it's no different here in Ohio County with that. One thing to keep in mind is that gels, older gels, are, have not been designed for the type of inmates that we have in jail today. Yes, part of the gel works well for the few inmates that are there for that type of design, but overall it's just something that's much different. So what happens is, is that 
the ALOS, the average length of stay, or the ADP, which is average daily population, those things increase because the inmates just are not successfully completing uh, their, their sentence that we go through that. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about page 28 uh, coming up to this, but one of the things that um, keeping in mind that it, is that most inmates, once they're released, most of them fail out in society and they will actually come back and they will spend more time in jail. And you can see some standards there is that within three years, two thirds of all inmates will be arrested and will serve time again. Some counties it's even much higher than that. And you probably, out of your 60, 70 inmates, you probably have 300 people in the county and it's a revolving door, it's the same people. They go through the system with that. And what we're trying to do in jail designs is, is to offer some opportunities to reform, to rehabilitate those inmates so they may not make those same, same mistakes over and over with that. Quite honestly, as I've heard other jailers and sheriffs tell me before is that they either mature or they die. And that's one of the things that sets how you keep them from coming back to jail. And not to be harsh about that, but in some cases that is the truth, unfortunately. And we've all have known someone personally that that's happened to. Page 29 is that there's always the question of well, what would happen if we didn't have a facility in our county? Um, how much would it cost us to go out to other counties and uh, send our inmates to them and let them take care of the issues? And we, we'll pay them. We know that there's transportation costs, there's management costs, there's uh, medical costs, behavioral management costs, all those things are associated with that. Your rate is a little bit lower than what it's showing on here, but uh, most counties in, uh, um, in Ohio, excuse me, not Ohio County, but most counties here in Kentucky are paying upwards of even $35 a day. Um, like in Ryan County, it's a, it's a regional jail where they're gonna be pulling from five different counties, and they worked out a deal of $35 a day. But if you were looking at $35 a day per inmate, 365 days a year, there's 100 inmates that's almost $1.3 million that you would pay to another county. It doesn't take into account all of the costs because it's actually more than that. Um, but $1.3 million would cover about 100 inmates uh, for that. When you get a financial advisor involved and they start to look at all those different options, alternatives on how to fund a project, that's one of the things that you always have to look at is, would it be less expensive if we just let somebody else um, handle our, our inmates? What I will caution you on is that not every facility in, in Kentucky has 100 beds for someone. And you, what you may wind up is sending uh, inmates from multiple different counties all across Kentucky, just not in neighboring counties, which obviously can get into a lot of cost of um, transporting them, not just from the actual transportation costs, but also from the, um, the staffing costs with that as well. The next couple pages is some information that I received um, from Rev and the staff about some things that are pretty interesting to see. Um, page 30 is uh, the dates going back to May 7th, or excuse me, May of 2008, and it really talks, about, and it's a May to May type of a, a fiscal year for this, but you start to look at what your average length of stay are um, and your, your numbers of people that are actually in your jail facility. And you can start to see, um, you can start to see your numbers that they go through the different um, parts with that. And you can also see the number of restees that you have on each one of those. You know, it, not, not just Kentucky, but several states across the country have tried to address this head on. Is do we keep um, inmates at the county level? Do we take them to a state level? How do we share? How do we address this across the board? Um, there's really no state in the country that is really addressing the correctional uh, ways uh, and means of incarcerating them, where it's a role model for everyone else to look at. Everyone's a little bit different, uh, but the thing of it is, is that you'll see in a couple more slides, is that our population of inmates have went, has went so high, so fast over the last 30 years, that there's a lot of people that are trying to uh, figure out the best way to address this. Um, one of the things also on page 31 was a breakdown of the charges of, and I, what I looked at was really the top five charges since 2007. The number of uh, those charges that have been um, uh, on a cumulative uh, number with that. 
and it's what I would ab absolutely expect, not just here, but in any county, is that your the issues of drugs is always number one. Number two, usually number three, four, and five. It just depends on how the charges are broken down. But obviously your top two charges of, of the drug, the buy, the possession, or of marijuana are absolutely your top two charges, then followed up with domestic violence. Um, very common, uh, but just kind of an interesting thing to look at since 2007, what those things are. And then also some of the other typical charges was really <coughs> rounding out the top 15 or so on charges in the last 10 years with that. Page 32 is a Page 32 is a breakdown of your males and females in total um, folks that you've had in your jail, your average daily population or ADP that we call that. Um, again, one of the things I think you'll see on this is that the male population has a slight decline and the reason for that is the female population is growing. So we've been able, the, the county has been able to look at how we're going to incarcerate females um, typically, females are not incarcerated as long as males. Get them through the system, get them out, do some different things with that, maybe a different crime. But one of the things that you are seeing is that the female population is going up in your facility um, since 2011 with that. Very typical of most jails um, across uh, Kentucky and even the Midwest with that. Another thing, um, keep in mind that these numbers are, they don't go up until you know, September 25th, it's a couple months back so that we can get through all the things. But you can see that in 2017, you have had, in your 52 bed jail, you've been up to um, at least 84 inmates in that jail. That's 32 over capacity. Literally, it's over um, 50, over 50% 50 over capacity on your jail. So as you can see in there, that your numbers um, typically been around the 70s. Um, into the 80s um, this year with that. Page 34 is some information I got directly from the 2016 Kentucky DOC report, Department of Corrections report. One of the things in, in talking with a couple of their administrators is that there has not been a complete new detention center, all in, everything detention center, opened in the last five years in Kentucky. There have been some additions, there's been some remodelings, but there has not been a complete new facility. Well, that's about to change. Um, Oldham County is opening um, the latter in here in just a couple months. Then Round County will be open in 18. And then there's also projects in Knox and Laurel County to address what their new needs are as well. But you can start to see, sorry about the graphic. Again, that was a, a, a specific thing I got from the BOC report. But you can start to see that um, um, the different types of jails that are across uh, Kentucky um, with that. On page 35 is a, a population analysis um, across Kentucky, something else that the BOC looked at. And you, you can look to see what your population growth has been in the last year or even three years in the facility. And you can also start to see across um, uh, Kentucky is that in the last year there's been an almost a 25% increase of inmates. If you look at from 9,880 in January to December had 11,445, uh, you, you're going up, or actually, excuse me, about 16% increase over that course of time, which is a lot of inmates. Um, and you're, you're filling it with, uh, with your facilities across Kentucky. And that's why there's actually some new buildings, new facilities that are being built. Page 36 um, is probably one of the most depressing slides I have. And it really talks about the state of incarceration across the United States. Uh, the, the, uh, the United States incarcerates more people per capita uh, than any other country in the world. Doesn't mean we have more crime. It just means that we incarcerate, we look at how we um, sentence people completely different than any other country in the world. Um, our percentage of incarceration is much higher than most of any other country in the world. One, it is the expectations of our citizens is, you know, do the crime, you do the time, as the saying goes with that. But as you can start to see, there's a graph in the bottom right from 1920 to uh, 
just past 2010, you can look at the huge spike of um, incarceration in the uh, 1980s and the 1990s. The war on drugs, a whole different approach to uh, jail facilities. And in fact, if you compare our population that's incarcerated today versus 1985, it is more than triple the amount of people that are incarcerated today versus in uh, 1985. So with this, as we all know that in the 1990s, the federal government, uh, they basically uh, transitioned most of the mental institutions. Uh, they looked at those of closing those more mainstreaming uh, people into society, looking at different ways for incarcerating them, uh, looking at different ways of treatment for that. And it's something that the correctional system, the whole justice system, we really need to catch up to some of those decisions that were made. Um, I'll stand here in front of you as I will in front of any other county that I do studies for. The, the solution is not to just go build a big jail. I absolutely and adamantly believe the solution is not to build a big jail. But one of the things is, is part of that is you have to look at other solutions to that other than just building a big jail. We've got a slide on that here in just a minute. But I, I just want to point that out very quickly. Um, page 38. Um, this, is, this is something that is, is very near and dear. If you know much about jails, you can really appreciate this. Um, I was working with a, uh, a sheriff and a jailer on a project, and this old sheriff, <coughs> he, he brought up the, his idea, and he said, Eric, if you ever get this to work, I want part of the money on your idea for this. But he said, you know, whenever I look at jails today, there really ought to be three doors going into the jail. One door doesn't fit everyone. That first door is what most people uh, consider is why people go to jail. They're the bad people. Uh, they're the ones that just commit a lot of crimes for very petty different reasons, all the way to hardened criminals with that. Most jails are designed for that type of person. However, what we see in jails today is that is typically the fewest, per, that is the fewest percentage of people that are in the jails. You get door two and door three, which is much more of what you're um, your incarcerated folks are. That door number two is the folks that have the addictions. Um, those folks with the addictions typically um, are more self-inflicting what the, their, their pains are, what their problems are, and yes, they may inflict some on other people, but not nearly as much as door number three, which is the behavioral management or the mental health uh, folks that are in jail. And each one of these people um, have a very different need in a jail facility, and that's why he said that, you know, whenever he looks at a jail, he thinks that there ought to be three doors, and you send that person into each one of those doors that's for that. So I think that one of the things that um, the Kentucky Department of Corrections, through their standards, is that they start to address what those different needs are and the different types of um, jail beds that are in the facility, whether it's the, the segregation, it used to be called isolation, the segregation beds, that are single man cells or two man cells to the, the parts that are the suicide uh, watches that are in your facility um, all the way up into more of a dorm style. They break it down into some very different specifics with that to be able to address those. A couple other items that I would uh, recommend on like page 39 and page 40 is some things to um, introduce into your overall um, justice system. And one is a crisis intervention team. Uh, there's actually a state conference here in a couple days later this week. But the crisis intervention team is at the point of arrest is, is this a person that needs to go to jail or do they need to go to some other type of a treatment facility to address what their needs are? Um, so often what we do in, in, in the um, corrections world today is everybody goes to jail. And that, that's a, a trend that it, it, it continues, but maybe there is an opportunity um, that there is a place where other people can go. If anybody wants to do any research down in Austin, Texas, they absolutely set the, uh, the model of how to deal with the, the CIT or the crisis intervention team of um, setting really standards and policies across the country for that. <clears throat> Another program is really looking at a jail diversion program is that once people get into jail, are there other ways to sentence them or other ways of uh, diverting them in lieu of just sitting in the jail, is there other programs that are with that? Maybe it's someone that has a serious mental um, situation and they need to be somewhere else other than in jail. Maybe it's a minor charge or they're willing to agree to go through some kind of a treatment in lieu of just serving their time in jail, maybe, which is very costly, 
uh, maybe there are, um, a better alternative is to take them to a different type of facility. As if in any county, um, expediting courts, court dates, whether it's initial hearing or when they're sentenced or any of the other things that fall under that, the faster you can process them through the system, <coughs> the better it is for everyone, both the inmate as well as the, uh, um, the overall size of the facility. If you can keep your average length of stay, if you can reduce that, um, it will reduce your average daily population, which in essence, you can have a smaller jail project uh, with that. Um, so often, as I talked about earlier, in three years, two-thirds of all inmates will uh, recommit a crime and spend time in jail again. Um, it's really looking at the community transition program. So often, uh, folks, they go to jail, they serve their time, they get released, they go back and they do the same thing. There's not been a lot of efforts put to them to try and reform them, to rehabilitate them, and also trying to develop some kind of a plan for that. Um, looking at those inmates that get released, who they get picked up by, the guy that they got in trouble with, and they go out and they do the same thing again, and they wind up in jail. But is there a way that you can do a tr community transition program? Something that in the United States about 2007, 2008 was a real hot topic that some counties across the country have worked on very hard and have actually been able to reduce um, some of their uh, populations in the jail. Page 41, uh, one of the things is um, always look at is, is your existing conditions of your jail. And, and we've been through that. Is that there are some options where um, counties will say, we need to go build a new jail. But the best solution may be actually to expand or renovate your existing jail. Um, your existing jail, like I said, it has, it's been good for almost 80 years. So I think one of the things in looking at is being able to expand the facility again is, is probably not the best solution with that because there's, there's just some code compliant issues, there's ADA compliant issues um, that are in the facility, let alone just all your core services. To be able to expand all the things that you need to really becomes something that's cost prohibitive. Most jails, I should, I should say that, um, jails today um, operate when they're most efficiently when they're at 80 percent occupied <clears throat> and that's in the this upper right hand corner on the orange page on the orange box on page 41 is really the 80 percent uh, rule is when jails are at 80 percent full you can still classify your image you can separate your prey and your predators within your facility um, and at 80 percent it is it is the the optimal number of where your inmates can still receive the safety the security aspects they have as well as the programs that can be offered to them as well as the safety and security of all your inmates with them so if you keep in mind that if you have 80 inmates in your facility today and you had 20 percent of that you roughly need a hundred bed jail today to be able to meet what those needs are um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind as you start to see some numbers here in a couple minutes. Okay. So page 42, and this really, the last two or three pages here really gets down into the essence of um, <coughs> your facility is again, we've talked about your facility, RIP and the staff, they've done a wonderful job in all the previous jailers and stuff, of being able to maintain it as long as they have. But whenever you start to look at your numbers, you're well over capacity today, your numbers are continually growing up, um, it, it's, it, you start to realize that all the societal needs of the addictions, mental health, behavioral management, those type of folks in your jail uh, make a big difference. <clears throat> also understand, as within any county, uh, funding is always is always something that really has to be um, explored and researched quite a bit before decisions can be made. And every dollar matters. <clears throat> We've talked about the operation, the staffing costs. Once you go through the design of the project, you also need to understand how you're going to pay for those operation and those maintenance costs, just not the bricks and mortar to build the building. Have a pretty much a pretty strong philosophy is you build once you build right but you also need to make sure that you can expand that in the future <clears throat> and also keep in mind that 20 percent classification factor page 43 is what is called a building program 
a building program, I like to refer to it as my wife's her recipe. She's going to make something um, for whatever occasion it may be. And she needs to know what all those different ingredients are in, a, in an overall of what she's making. And I look at a building program and it's something that's very similar to that. <coughs> the building program really breaks down all the different rooms, the different spaces in the overall facility. It also breaks down what the size of each one of those spaces are and how many of those spaces that you need. Um, our feasibility study has not collectively went through a building program by any means, but what I've done is whenever I start to look at a facility and I start to look at what some projected costs are, <clears throat> I start to think about big picture some of those different items that are in a facility of this type. And so I, what I did was I went through and I broke down the different numbers in my spreadsheets to be able to see, uh, to get to 160 bed jail, what are the different types of components that you would have in that facility. You may say once you get into a design phase, uh, Rip or somebody else may say, I need this space or I need this space, but I don't need that. And that's all part of the evolution of the design, but it gets you a pretty good starting point for a feasibility study of where that's at. So if you turn to page 44 and 45, the last two pages, page 44 is the one that starts to talk about the cost of a building. Um, what I look at is that I look at the demographics, I look at the types of inmates, I look at the age of the folks that are living in your community, and also I start to look at the trends that have been in your jail facility, as well as other counties throughout um, Kentucky, <coughs> and try to compare them to other counties across Kentucky and see what kind of uh, capacity that they may need. Um, what I come up with is, is for the year 2040 plan, to get to the year 2040, is that you're going to need approximately 160 beds in your facility. Um, that 160 beds, keep in mind that there about 20% of that would be for classification, separation of prey and predator. So that really, if you take that uh, 30 off, that's about 130 inmates that you would have in your facility. Um, you know, and just talking with Rip and others is that we fully expect within the next couple of years that you may hit 100 in your facility. Now, of course, if, if something changes within legislation, <clears throat> if something changes within how you incarcerate folks, um, something changes, those numbers can be skewed a little bit. But what I project is that for the year um, 2040 is that you would need a rated bed capacity of about 160. Um, I don't think you're going to need more than that um, based on some of the things that you have in your county, but I think that that's, that's a very realistic number with that. A couple things that go into that is that you don't need 160 beds today. You're not going to need them in five years from now. But one thing I will tell you that is if you have more beds today, you're likely going to fill them today. It's, it's the, the baseball move. Build it and they'll come to fill the dreams. Is that if you increase your jail to 100 beds today, you will probably fill that. If you get to 120, probably not. 140, no. 160, definitely not today. <clears throat> but I, I will tell you that anytime you go through or a county goes through a correctional project, your numbers will, they will um, peak, but then they will start to level off and they'll start to come back down. It happens everywhere. It's just a nature of the system with that. Um, so once you go through a project, don't get overly concerned that your numbers go up because they will start to settle and they'll start to come down a little bit with that. In looking at a facility of this size of 160 beds, once we go through and we calculate those core services, again, the spaces like the intake, the processing, the holding area, <coughs> the kitchen, the laundry, the mechanical, the storage space, I call that the core services. We don't design those areas for 160 inmates. We design it for something larger. And, it, and the reason for that is that at some point in the future that you may have to expand your facility, expanding those core services can be very difficult. For example, we'll take a laundry room. At 160 uh, beds, say you need one commercial grade, industrial type washer and one dryer. You may need two, but we'd have to go through and do calculations on how many hours a week you want to do laundry, et cetera, et cetera. What you may have to have is when you get to 250 inmates, may never happen, but if you get to 250 inmates, you may have to put a second washer and a second dryer in there. 
Well, let's design the space today so that extra three feet for that washer is there so that the two washers can be next to each other in the future. The same thing about a kitchen. You, you may have a kettle and you get to 250 and makes you may need to have a second one. Well, let's put a space for those few items into that or a sewer line or a water line that comes into a site. Instead of a six inch line, let's put an eight inch line so we can expand to have some of those different things. The cost today is minimal compared to what it would be in the future if you had to increase some of those things in the future. So we both looked at those core services for a gel that's much, much larger than that any time in any kind of conceivable uh, future that you would ever need, but we've looked at that at 250 beds. Does that add much cost to the project? It's absolutely not much cost, but it's just good design that goes in into those items. The other thing is I pointed out to the gel committee is that we said 160 beds. Like we did over uh, Round County is that we started off um, and we did an addition, we did uh, 262 beds and then we did 40 beds as an alternate. Um, that 40 beds is an add an alternate. The cost for that was just under $500,000. So whenever you start adding beds, if you go from 160 to 320 beds, does not mean you double the cost because some of those core services that we talk about so much, those are already there. We're just adding beds. So one of the things I always would look at and always recommend is we say 160, but you know what? Let's do an alternate for 180. Let's do an alternate for 200 beds and just see what that cost is. Because one of the things that you can do is you can go out and find other counties throughout um, Kentucky or even state inmates even federal inmates, but there's some different requirements for that. And maybe you could start to house them here in Ohio County so that you can, and I know that Ron County, we went through the whole performa of if we added this many beds, how much money could we get coming in to help offset some of those costs? Uh, one thing I would highly encourage is that as you go through that process, be very careful not to overbuild so much that at some point in time, you may not be able to pay for it if you don't have that revenue come in. You know, don't overbuild for the sake of trying to live on that extra money's coming in. Help your neighbors, help your state, do what they can, but also at the same time, make sure that you can afford what you are building. I just don't want any county to ever get in any trouble of building a jail. It's more of a hotel for other counties. Um, but also keep in mind that those, some of those costs are in line. So there's two, there's two numbers on this page. There's the hard construction cost, that's the brick and mortar, the, the duct work, all those things to go build the building. And then there's things just like when you go buy a car or you buy a house, there's all those extra costs that go on top of it. That can be land acquisition, it could be you have to run extra utilities half a mile, mile, two miles down the road, wherever a site may be, which there's absolutely been no uh, preconceived ideas on any sites. Um, you're going to have things like surveys, geotechnical investigations, legal fees, your financing costs, all those things are on top of that hard construction cost. And that's typically 25 to 30% depending on how you can pay for the overall project. So those are two very different numbers. One is the number on bid day and then the other is the number that you would need to be able to finance to be able to make the overall uh, project work. Just as a reminder, you probably all know that the Kentucky Department of Corrections, they do pay for the architect's fees. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. And um, that can be a wide variety of what those costs are. Uh, there's paperwork <laughs> that you have to go through, but they do pay for that. So we've talked about a lot of stuff here. And somebody may say in the, in the county, of, okay, I, I understand. I understand that we need to build something. Um, how long does this take? It doesn't happen overnight. Once the fiscal court and, and, and the community, everybody buys into this and you say, yes, this is the size of jail. This is where it's going to be built. This is how much we're going to cost. Once that decision, you're almost for, for sure, all that place is in, is in line, then you start the design of the project. And within that design of the project, Time you go through and we have our, all of our committee meetings and we talk about the jail and what it looks like and you go through local approvals and state approvals on the design, 
the state DOC, they sign off on it. It takes about five to six months to get through that design stuff. Bigger jobs obviously will take longer, but about five or six months to get through all that. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into developing one of these designs. Then you go through a couple months of bidding. <clears throat> you as you did with your bridge, you release your documents out to the bidders, uh, you receive the bids, you review the bids, you award the bids, you write the contracts, that takes a couple months. And then you, then you go build the building. And depending on the size of the building, 15, 16, 17, 18 months, somewhere in there. So you start adding all that up, is that once you get in a position of going, yes, let's go, it's, it's at least two years before RIP, whoever, they move into that facility, they do the transition to the facility, they do the training, the procedures, and the policies of uh, making all that happen. So one of the questions that was asked is, okay, we built 160 bed jail. How quickly are we going to be to 160? Um, one of the things I would say first and foremost is, at any time you move from a facility to another facility, there's some training, there's some procedures, there's likely new staff that are gonna come on board with that. Take care of your own inmates for a little while. Whether it's two months, three months, six months, take care of your own inmates very well. Get used to the facility with those inmates in there, then start bringing in inmates from other counties. And you know, if you had the 160, you take off the 30 or so for that 20%, um, you know, about the 130. Start thinking about getting 120, 130, those numbers about a year from now. Don't do it day one. Um, you know, let's, let's be able to maintain the facility, what, what we have, and transition into that. So, a lot of information I presented there, um, and I'd like to open it up to any questions that you may have. I'm sure you can have some. Uh, Eric, have you, uh, have you built any regional jails lately or anything like Ryan that? County in Moorhead. Where's that, Moorhead? Moorhead, yes. And how's it working out? Well, it's going to be open in February. Uh, we're just completing uh, construction. We've got a meeting there on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, it's working out very well. Um, How many counties are involved? Or? Five counties. There's five counties. It's 302 beds. Uh, I'm satisfied you deal with the state all the time. Then, uh, is, is the state still promoting the regional jails like they were years ago? In, in talking with Kentucky Department of Corrections, which I try to talk to them quite a bit, uh, they are promoting that just because some counties have more ability uh, to be able to finance and to do the projects, but they are absolutely... Ultimately, they're trying to find the best solution for everyone. And the regional jails at this point, and especially going through Round County, it was what worked best for that area. Well, I noticed on your chart here that uh, Hancock County doesn't have a full set of jail, neither does McLean County. And I was just wondering, uh, of course, Hancock County may find it more feasible to go to Hancock. Uh, sure. Of, uh, if they have beds. Yeah, if they have beds or whatever. Yeah. So it's something. Uh, uh, is it cheaper? Another point I want to make or ask, is it cheaper to build a two-story as, as compared to the single level jail? Well, I, I'd like to define that a little bit more clear. Is um, when you say two levels, if we are talking about um, literally like a two-story house, typically the answer is no. And the reason is not because of construction costs, it's because of the operation and staffing costs. Ideally, if you could sit right there and see the whole crowd, it would be better than if we put a wall in the middle and you had to look cameras to look at the other side, or you had to add another person to the other side. Um, so ideally, most jails, most any person that operates a jail would prefer a one level jail because your, your cost <coughs> of your staff can be duplicated when you go to a second level. There are situations where the site dictates that you have to build multiple levels. And one of my last questions is uh, juveniles. Mm -hmm. Is it feasible for Ohio County to look at uh, building a jail that uh, incarcerates juveniles? I know they pay more. It would probably cost more to be able to jail itself to accommodate them or whatever. You have to be able to separate sight and sound of the juveniles from the adults. Um, you know, there are there are different regulations for juveniles than for adults. If you can um, do that, 
Uh, there are opportunities for that, but you also really need to start to think about how many juveniles you might have or that you could pull even from a region uh, because some of the requirements are actually more expensive and a little more restrictive than what would be for adults. Yeah, but they do they do pay more. Yeah. I understand they're, they're correct in saying that Davis County has closed thirds that Bowling Green is the only one currently open on the juvenile end of it. I'm not positive. I'm not either. That was only a day treatment that shut down in Orangeboro. It was a sex offender. So what it was over on 54. That wasn't a, that was just a regular treatment facility that the state of the UDA did Thank you. Uh, Gentlemen, the judge had to leave unexpectedly. He had a, a prior appointment, but uh, is, there any, is there any more questions for Eric? Just of the 39, why, why are the 39 closed? Do you have any idea? Are they just recently closed, or is this something? I, I pulled that in. I can get information for you on that specifically. Uh, I'll talk to PYDOC. I talked to one county, and they had closed because of the cost of what it was going to be to build a jail. And I said, well, where are you at? Well, we're running about the same as what we were when we were running the jail before, but we didn't add the expense on the actual construction of a new jail. Again, that's where I say that during the design phase, I can tell you how much the building costs, but I also need to tell you how much it's gonna operate and maintain that facility. That That is the difference why some facilities work and some don't. You don't have that in here? I was gonna say, we, we haven't designed it, so I, I can't tell you. Are you telling us this is, this is our feasibility center? Are you telling it's feasible or are you telling it's not feasible? That was kind of the yeah, question. I actually thought that's what you're going to tell the us. The cost to run the facility was going to be kind of figured in the feasibility study and maybe other monies out there to help us build it. Well, I can, we can absolutely look at some preliminary staffing on the facility, um, but this is really not just a one step process because if somebody adamantly disagrees that a size of the facility should be larger or smaller, then our whole formulas and calculations for staffing and operation costs can be different. You know, we can give you absolutely what the cost would be to maintain a 160-bed facility. Eric, did y'all build the uh, Berkeley County no. Detention Center? No, I went up uh, a couple weeks ago. I knew this was coming down the pike, so I went up and talked to the treasurer along with the uh, county judge up there in Greece. And, uh, but they're over the hump, but there for several years, they had some serious difficulty making the financial obligations as far as the payments is coming. And I think what this court is going to have to look at, we're going to have to find ways, uh, after looking at this number, we're going to have to find ways, whether it be regional, whether it be monies from the, uh, uh, some grant monies from state or grant monies from federal grant monies to help us, uh, to help us get this thing started or whatever. But we certainly needed this feasibility study to do that. I think you guys have put together the study. Uh, and I appreciate it. I think it belongs to as well as the rest of the court members. Uh, but uh, any further questions for Eric? Hey, I got just a couple more. Sure. Just, of these counties, can you tell us the county that has 160, 160 bed jails? I can uh, get the information. I don't have the breakdown. I, I tried to get all that stuff from the Kentucky Department of Corrections. They said that since 2010 is when they really started putting their uh, numbers together. I'll have to t I'll have to ask them if they can. Uh, Give me examples of new 160 bed jails. And I'm, I'm sorry, that's kind of thought. That's kind of what you were going to come take 160 bed jail. You were going to take our numbers and then come back and say, yes, you can or no, you can afford this. It's kind of what I thought. My understanding. I also was, thought you're wanting to know if this is what we're wanting to look at. To say this is what we're wanting to look at as far as 160 bed to see what the operational cost would be. Sure. Can you get us that? Is there going to be an extra cost? No, we can do that. I mean, it's really a two-step process is that, you know, we, we <coughs> go through and we analyze what we think the facility should be. Um, you know, part of that is that the, the actual design, that number, what we look at is that, say it's $12.5 million for construction. What we look at is that the goals are, is to get 160 inmates and to maintain that cost for less is that's what the absolute goal is. And then we start going through in that building program and we define what those different spaces are. But once we get into those, those finite details is where the more specific ideas of the cost to operate that facility. I can show you that it will take three people to operate a facility. 
You go in the design, you make some different, which we're not there. This is a study. You get in the design, and we start to look at some things differently, and you say, I need a fourth person to be able to operate that gel. Well, at $40,000 a year times five people, you know, that's $200,000 that you need one extra position for that that we didn't know in the study process. So I can absolutely give you, based on other facilities we've done, um, Kentucky Department of Correction, they typically have two people in all of our construction moving around. I'll sit down with them on Thursday and talk to them about it. Um, but it, it's not, the, the study doesn't say your revenue stream and study those of how you can actually make your, uh, your payments on a biannual basis or semi-annual basis with that of what your tax rate, the, the study, I'm an architect, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't do the analysis of your, your typical citizen that makes $42,000 a year, lives in an $85,000 house, how do they pay for that? That's what a financial consultant does from that. And that's why that last page is, is what I'm doing is I'm projecting what your needs are. And from those needs, this is the approximate cost to do that. And from those costs, I can tell you what the costs are to, to um, staff the facility, to maintain the facility, to do those typical improvements that you need to do to the year 2040. But it's the, the CPA is the one that tells you the tax codes, the, the financial laws and regulations, they're the ones that tell you how to break down and see what that cost of the facility is. I think to your question, you know, we had talked at the last time about, you know, not being able to go into the finances. What we can do is say that what we see is that a 160-bed facility is, you know, it can be maintained over this time period. Now, from there, it's going to be up to Ann and the other folks, you know, that handle the county's finances to work with some of these financial managers. I know there are some with KCO, there are some others that work in the state that do the bonding that can project out, you know, what it's going to cost if you were to bond a certain level over time. And then it's up to you all to decide if you can bear the cost of that over, over that period. Uh, but to your to your point, uh, that is the the size of jail that you can that you can put inmates into that that you have in your average population over the next twenty years. And Rip, is we got the two that are closed, Hancock and McLean. What do they do with their inmates now? Uh, McLean County. Yeah. Go to Davis County and the other one, Hancock. Yeah. Rector. Okay. Did Davis County work out a deal to bring their inmates there? Is that what they did? Their jail wasn't? Uh, they took over the animal shelter too. Yeah. Because I think they came here and talked to us. Did, did the judge? Yeah. Badly. The problem we're having now is uh, our neighboring county jail is big. They put a pros on freeze on us giving them our inmates that state because they're overcrowded. Uh, they're also telling me, we used to say, if you got two state prisoners, you don't want them? The question would be, how much medicine are they on? Because they've got in their problem. Now the question is that, plus are they sex offenders? Because we're running over the sex offenders and we're causing problems. So now we're starting this month. I told Tracy, we gotta go all the way to Christian County now with my first one. Okay. Well, I was just thinking about those three. If they were already going to Davis County, you were talking about a regional jail. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if that would be feasible or not, but if they're in Brecks, Hancock's going somewhere to Breck or something like that, and Davis County is full, which I, I thought they weren't, but maybe it's just a full guy. Any other questions, guys? At one time, I thought when you was here before, that was also going to maybe through your experiences. Uh, we've built jails before. Is there monies out there that can grant monies from the state and federal that's uh, possibly available to a county like Ohio? Typically, any kind of monies are available are more for operational than not for bricks and mortar, is from it? my understanding, is that they will help you. Um, develop more programs for rehabilitation reforming the inmates but to uh, go build you an extra 40 beds money just somebody can tell me I, I, i'd like to know because i get asked the question all the time that there's just not money for that that's what they told us in the seminar that we've been to right there yeah 
They said that, that there's been so many jails built that they, they've gone away from that direction and, and that's where they told us not to build jails. But, you know, it could have been because they wanted to, you know, so there's two things they tell us at every seminar. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna say this. <laughs> Do not build a jail because you cannot afford it and do not support your constables financially or anyway. Is that not correct? And that's what they tell us, people who are building. And, and then, you know, that was put on by the... Uh, he, was a, he was a jailer. He was over the jail administration, the way I understand, for Kentucky. He wanted to tell us that. But like I said, he might be that they didn't want the competition. Or was this a private prison contract or something like that? No, this, this, no, this was at the... Oh, I can't think of the jailer called Yeah, association guy, yeah. was it? Yeah. Oh, jailer association. Okay. Yeah, he was the president of the jailer association. Well, we've been talking about Oldham County. Oldham County, right there. Yeah, I think it's Mike Simpson, Oldham County. Mike Simpson. Guess what? He's building a new jail. It opens in two months. Yeah. <laughs> Just being honest. He tells us the first thing to do is get them in, get them booked, put an ankle uh, bracelet on them, and send them back out. Yeah, sure. So you're not allowed to them. Yeah. And we talked about part of that, and that diversion program that we talked about in here. That's absolutely that. Is the longer you keep someone in jail, the more expensive it's going to be for you. You got to get them out. They got medical issues. You got to get them out. Yeah. Don't let them sit in jail. Yeah, we've had some inmates that had some serious health problems, and before they were uh, sentenced to the state prison, it was. Uh, I don't think. Uh, Jason may have been on the court. Board with them. I just, I think I just came in. Yeah, because I, I don't rip with the jailer at that particular time, but it was really, really expensive every month, and he had some serious health issues. So, uh, but I do want to thank you guys for coming today. Good questions, uh, good information. Thanks. Uh, let us kick it around a little bit and see what we come up with, and uh, see if we can find secure some types of funding or whatever those. I do know our budget. Every one of us up here studies this budget. We know our budget. And uh, we'll have to have some financial help to, to make it happen. But, uh, thanks again for the. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Are y'all doing yeah. Odom County? Are y'all building? We're doing around County. Kind of, no, not Odom County. So, yeah, doing all on your, if you're going to come up with some basic number sure. for us, do me a favor. Get two. Get one for the 160 and one for 100. Okay. Instead of just maxing out all one. Let's okay. see where we're going, what we do at 100. Okay. Yep. You'll probably find that your, your staffing costs probably aren't much different. And that's kind of what I want to see. Yeah. Because in, in, in the way we look at designs, whether you basically oversee 50 inmates, 60 inmates, 100 inmates, it's pretty much the same. You get to a point that just one person physically, you just can't <laughs> see that much of an area. And then that's where it really starts getting in some additional costs. Yeah, we'll get you some numbers on that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Is there uh, anybody in the audience, audience has any comments or would look wishing to make a comment, whatever? If not, this meeting is adjourned. Uh,